Okay, so in the previous video, we looked at calculating some probabilities where we had equally likely outcomes and equally likely events. Um, but in practice, uh, many probabilities are estimated by experimentation. So for example, the probability that it will rain tomorrow is based in part on the likelihood of rain on that date in the past. Um, the probability of that Richmond will win the, the game next weekend, which is ironic given the timing this year and there won't be a game next weekend and they won the grand final. But anyway, um, it's based in part on their performance in the last few games. Um, so we use data to make predictions or, or to estimate probabilities. We use what we've seen before. Um, and obviously there's a lot more complex calculation that goes into predicting the weather than just looking at what's happened on this date in the past. There's a lot of science in that. But but the point is, is that there are a number of things that we make predictions for, that we estimate probabilities for, where we're not basing that on theoretical probability. We don't know that these things are equally likely to happen and therefore we can't calculate a theoretical probability. Um, so for example, if we were to roll a biased die, so a, a not fair die, so not where it's equally likely to land on each um, side. If we were to roll that bias die 100 times and obtain a six in 40 of those rolls, then we could deduce that the probability of rolling a six with this die in the future will be approximately four out of 100 or, or 0.4. A probability obtained in this manner is called the relative frequency of an event. And all we're doing here to calculate the relative frequency of event A occurring is to look at the number of times event A is observed um, divided by the total number of trials we did. Now, if the number of trials is sufficiently large, so the more trials we get, the more reliable our probability will be. Um, and so for a large number of trials, the relative frequency becomes close to the actual probability. Okay? So the probability of A um, is approximately equal to our relative frequency as long as we've done a large number of trials. So obviously if we were to roll the die you know, 10,000 times, we could suggest that that would be a pretty good estimate for the actual probability of rolling a six with this particular bias die. Okay, let's work through some examples. In order to investigate the gender of the clientele at a particular shop, John stands at the door to the shop and notes the gender of the first 200 people to enter the shop. He observes 140 women and 60 men. Mary spends three full days at the shop and records 532 women out of the 704 people that enter the shop in that time. What is John's estimate of the probability of a client in the, of the shop being female? Okay. Um, so John's estimate, the probability of a female is going to be, now what did John see? 140 women out of the 200 people he observed. So that is 14 out of 20, which is 7 out of 10, or 0.7. What is Mary's estimate? Okay, so Mary saw 704 people. So the probability of a female, according to Mary, is 532 out of 704. Just so we can compare those, I'm just going to get my CAS to simplify that. Sorry, so 532 out of 704. Okay, it simplifies to 133 over 176. I'm just going to get a decimal approximation, which is about 0 0.7557. Okay, so she got a slightly higher proportion than John. Given the available information, what is the best estimate for the probability of a client of the shop being female? Okay, so this isn't asking you out of parts A and B which one's better. Obviously, Mary's estimate is better because she surveyed, she had more people. Um, she saw, she collected more data. But given the available information, um, we could add together John and Mary's data and have an even better prediction. Okay, Combined prediction in this case would be better, although we would have to know that John and Mary weren't at the shop on the same day, otherwise we'd be counting the same data twice, which isn't valid. Um, so yeah, there's probably some more information required here, but I'm going to go with, we've got 140 plus 532 women out of 200 plus 704 observations. So 140, sorry, 140 plus 532. So that's 672 out of 904, which simplifies to 84 on 113, or approximately, just to give us a sense of how it compares to the other ones. Oh, sorry. 84 on 113, uh, 0.7434.
Okay, so somewhere between their two estimates, but definitely closer to Mary's because she had a lot more data um, is the best prediction given what we've got there. All right, probabilities involving area. Um, so these would be theoretical probabilities. We can calculate precise probabilities. Um, find the probability that a pointer lands in region A and the spin is shown. Okay, so we essentially want to work out, so the probability that the spinner will land in region A is the area of A over the total area of the spinner. Okay, so the total area of the spinner, uh, now, we don't actually even know the area in this case because we don't know what the radius of the spinner is. So I'm going to instead be comparing, so I'm going to leave that, sorry, let me erase that which is the same as finding the angle of A, angle of the sector A, over 360 degrees. That's going to allow us to work out what fraction of the circle that we have here. So we've got 60 degrees there, we've got 90 degrees there, which means that there is a total of 150 degrees there. We know there's 360 in total in a circle, so 360 minus 150 is 210 degrees out here. So A makes up 210 degrees out of 360 degrees in the circle. So that is 21 out of 36 um, would be the probability there. So you can get a rough estimate. Um, sorry, it does simplify. Three is a common factor, so seven out of 12. So seven twelfths would be the probability of the spinner landing in region A. Example three, a target is a circle inscribed in a square of side length 1.2 metres as shown. Okay, so sorry, it doesn't show any dimensions, but 1.2 metres and it's a square. Assuming that it's impossible to miss the target, so we have to hit somewhere on the square, find the probability that a randomly thrown dart will land in the shaded region. Okay, so the probability of hitting the shaded region is going to be the shaded area take away the total area of the target. I'm sorry, not take away, divided by the total area of the target. Okay, so the shaded area is going to be the area of the square, which is 1.2 squared, take away um, the area of the circle. Now, the radius of that circle is 0.6, so that's going to be 0.6, sorry, pi times 0.6 squared over the total area is the 1.2 squared. Now I'm going to add, find the probability, I'm going to say correct to four decimal places here because this is not very nice exactly. But if it doesn't tell you to give around that, so then you should leave it exact. Okay, so 1.2 squared minus pi times 1 point, sorry, 0.6 squared, the circle, over 1.2 squared. That is approximately, to four decimal places, 0.2146, the probability that a randomly thrown dart will land in the shaded region. Okay, so the work today is from exercise 9b. Just continuing to work out some basic probability questions, some involving area, and some thinking about experimental probabilities.